All right. Welcome, everyone, and hello uh, for tonight's Youth Lead webinar. My name is Tommy, and I'll be moderating this evening's webinar. Uh, tonight, we are focusing on uh, navigating employment. Uh, what makes it especially uh, fantastic tonight is that we have some of our alumni to express their experiences, talk about what they've been through, and also give some tips and tricks um, for athletes and everyone listening. Uh, for everyone listening live, please hold all questions until the end. We will have a few minutes at the very end for questions, so go ahead and use that chat feature and put it down below. Um, for anyone that are listening to the recorded webinar, thank you so much for tuning in to our YouTube channel. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out via our website. you find my contact information along with all of our Blaze staff that are more than willing to help. Uh, but without further ado, I would like to take some time to introduce our incredible uh, panelists. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and say their names. I'm gonna let them take it away, and introduce themselves. Uh, so we are joined here tonight uh, with Joshua Joins and Maggie Frederick. Um, as you saw on some of the promotional, uh, we were going to have another incredible alumni uh, named Brian, but unfortunately he cannot make it tonight, um, but we still have a wonderful pair of Josh and Maggie. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and hand over the virtual microphone to you, Josh, kind of give us a background setting the, um, the tone, explain your relationship with Blaze Sports. What did you do at Blaze? How long you were at Blaze Sports? And then what are you doing now? Where did you go to school and what is your current job now? Yeah, absolutely. So my involvement with Blaze started when I was 12 years old. Um, I joined our prep uh, wheelchair basketball team, um, fell in love with the sport and, and rode that throughout the high school years. So I think I played with Blaze for six years through my senior year of high school. Um, and then also did some track and field as well, um, but was, got outclassed pretty heavily in that sport. So <laughs> decided basketball was where it was at. Um, and then I attended college at the University of Illinois where I played wheelchair basketball and got my bachelor's in political science. Um, and then shortly after that, came back to Blaze again um, as an assistant coach on our basketball program. Um, and while I was looking for jobs, um, and I knew I kind of wanted to work in the college uh, uh, athletic space and uh, in fundraising specifically. Um, so I applied to a job at the University of Utah here in Salt Lake City um, as a development officer. So I'm in charge of uh, 3,300 accounts for season ticket holders and donors, inserting them and making sure that uh, they still want to be involved with Utah Athletics. Um, so uh, that is what I'm doing now, um, and I'm happy to be here. Awesome. Well, thank you, Josh. I appreciate that. I can't wait to learn more about what that role is and, and what you've experienced. Uh, really glad to have you on tonight. Uh, now, virtual microphone over to Maggie. Hi, uh, my name is Maggie Frederick, and my involvement with Blaze uh, started when I was 10. Um, I'm actually one of the original Blaze athletes when Blaze started. Um, I My first two sports I did was wheelchair basketball and track, and then I did a little bit of uh, swimming. And when I graduated, I went to the University of Illinois as well. And I my major was speech and hearing science. Um, I will admit that by the time I wanted to switch that degree, it was too far in. So I graduated with, with that degree. I don't do anything with it. <laughs> um, so I actually moved back to Georgia. And um, while I was looking for a job, I interned at Blaze. And then um, I got hired on at Blaze as their office manager. And I also got to help out with their um, activities like Blaze Days and things like that. And I also volunteer, volunteered as a track coach, which I still do that today. Um, but now professionally, I work for the city of Sandy Springs in their parks and rec department. Um, so I do all of their after school activities. And right now we have um, summer camp. So I'm one of the, one of the counselors and um, yeah. That's awesome. Uh, for those listening, I hope you can kind of catch a theme that once you're in our programs and once you exit, we'd love to keep you involved because you're just absolutely wonderful resources for, you know, the staff here to learn uh, and then also for those athletes going through the program. Um, before we kind of go into the questions, I thought that this would be a nice way to kind of set the tone a little bit more for those listening that don't really know you guys that well. Um, and if you don't mind me asking or if you don't mind kind of elaborating, would you mind just going into just the slightest bit of detail of what disability you have and if you use a, a chair or an assistive device in any way? Uh, Josh, you can go ahead, go first. 
All right, cool. So yeah, so I uh, I was born with spina bifida. Um, it's one of the most common neural tube defects in the, in the country. Um, uh, I do not use a wheelchair on the day-to-day -day basis. I walk with the uh, use of AFOs without uh, my leg braces. I would not be able to walk very far. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of what my disability is. Yeah, thanks, Josh. Maggie? I also have spina bifida, but I do use a wheelchair. <laughs> Full time. Awesome. Yes. Yeah, awesome. Well, I wanted to kind of set the tone for some of these questions for those, you know, listening in may use chairs full time or may not. So um, I think it's really important to kind of put those put those things out there. Um, okay. So kind of putting our focus into your current career right now, the job that you held now, but of course, you can talk about past experiences and whatnot. Um, but let's start off right in the beginning. Let's talk about that application process. Um, walk me through it. Right. Did you find that there was any barriers knowing that you had a disability or needed some accommodations when you were applying. Um, so just kind of walk me through that. And then also, like I mentioned, if you have some experiences from another job that you'd like to elaborate on, feel free to, uh, but kind of open it up there. Application process. Talk to me about it. No, you, you go, go first reason. because okay. it's been more fresh for you. I don't, <laughs> I have to think about it a little bit, I think. Yeah, so uh, full disclosure, I applied to somewhere in the neighborhood of 35 jobs um, before I got this one, part of which was um, I got my degree in political science and a lot like Maggie, towards the end, I realized I didn't want to do that. Um, so it was, it was figuring out how to leverage my degree to get to where I wanted to go. Um, and that took a second. Um, but I think it's... Um, there, there weren't really any barriers in, in the process. You know, uh, part of ADA is that your employer can't specifically ask you questions about your disability, which really puts the onus on you um, to explain your disability to uh, your, your, your possible employer um, throughout the process. I think the pandemic was very helpful in the fact that a lot of interviews these days are virtual, um, which means if you choose to, uh, they don't have to know that you're in a wheelchair or have a disability in a way that you would obviously have in an in-person interview. So I think that is an advantage, but um, it's, it's kind of doing that fine line of, of explaining your disability enough that it's not going to be a shock and that you can effectively do the job, um, but not over explaining it to where they think it's going to be, you know, more of a burden than you are a benefit to the company that you're working for. Um, and so that's kind of, kind of what I was trying to do is, is like, yeah, I have a disability and here are, you know, three things that, you know, I might need accommodations on, like, uh, you know, a day off for uh, medical appointments or whatnot, but here's the extra value that I bring that, you know, will counteract that. So I think that's kind of the, the balance you have to play because you, you don't want to, you know, hide your disability and hide who you are and you want to make sure it's a good fit. Um, but you also, you know, there are, is some uh, reluctancy to hire some of the disability. So playing that role was something that, that I got pretty good at through all of the interviews in the process. I think in the jobs that I've actually held and got, um, you know, hired on, I haven't actually needed any accommodations um, just for the, the nature of the job and the office is, you know, we're set up well and, and whatnot. Um, but I did interview for a job one time that I, like, the, it was interesting because it was um, a company that actually worked with babies, um, toddlers that have disabilities. And, but it was gonna be like a lot of filing and things like that. And so they actually brought me into the room that I'd be working in um, if I were to get hired and how I would be able to function in that room, whether I, you know, making sure I could reach the files and things like that. So they were accommodating in that way. I did not get the job. I'm not really sure if it, if because they would have had to change things up if that played a role. Um, like Josh said, they technically can't discriminate um, and they can't you know, legally not hire you because of your disability. But I, I do think that it, it, especially when you have a, a visible physical disability, it does, um, I think impact it and make it a little bit more challenging um, because whether you you do have to be confident when you're telling them, you know, that you can do the job and how to, um, what accommodations you need. But I think that sometimes employers kind of take the, the easier route out and hire someone that they don't have to do those accommodations for. So um, 
you know, as you can tell from Josh's story, he applied to, to tons of jobs. And I, I think it's just, you gotta not give up and keep pushing until you find that person that um, is willing to, to take a chance on you and to hire you. Um, also, the one thing that I kind of had to tell myself that was if you weren't gonna get hired by certain jobs because of your disability, whether or not like you knew that or not, um, that wasn't a place you wanted to be at anyways. So, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think those are all wonderful. Josh, did you have another statement to say? I don't know if you were ready to unmute yourself. Yeah, uh, I, I was talking to a female friend of my, mine that's in the same industry um, and there's this really common saying um, with women is like, in a male dominated industry, women have to work twice as hard to get half as far. And I think that is true uh, in every industry for people with disabilities, because every industry is an able bodied, uh, you know, dominated industry. Um, so I mean, that's just why it's so much more important for, you know, your resume to look really good um, as you're applying for these jobs, because you do have to be better than these other candidates that are applying for it. Can I add something to that? Of course. So from personal experience as well, um, when I was thinking about the jobs that I have held, I've out of, I've had three, I've worked in three different places. Blaze actually I've worked at twice, <laughs> um, but two out of the three, I had a connection. Um, I knew someone. So the only place that um, I, I did a sales job and that was the only place that I did not know somebody that I purely, I applied, got a call, got an interview and, and got the job. Um, but everywhere else, like the, the job I have now, someone introduced me to my boss and that was how I did it. So I do think that that is, um, they actually like for anyone disability or not, that's actually a really great way to get a job. It's actually the most effective. But I think that it is way more true for people with disabilities. Can I add one more thing to that? Of course, yeah. Um, so yeah, I know that this is geared towards high schoolers, but uh, something I wish I'd done earlier is LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn is just such an effective source of like, now every single person I meet in my industry, I'm adding them on LinkedIn, whether it be one conversation or five. And just so you have those connections, because you know one day you might have a job that you're looking at, um, you know, and you look and someone works in that department, you know, just that one interaction you had with them might lead to like, yeah, I want to hire that person. So the earlier you get on LinkedIn and you get accustomed to like what that looks like, I think the better. Um, that's more of a college thing for sure. But, you know, the earlier, the better. Yeah, those were all amazing, just pieces of, of knowledge and, and, and experience. Um, so <clears throat> just kind of to kind of Put it all together what, what, what I gathered from it is that for the application process there wasn't really any barriers that you've noticed that like hey in this application it just specifically asks you to outline if you have a disability or or if you need accommodations um, which is great to hear that's that's exactly um why well, Maggie were you going to say something I saw you on mute I was just going to say that this is going to be personal preference however you want to handle it I like so there is a question on the application um, that does ask you, but it's optional. So on the application itself, you do not have to put whether or not you have a disability. I personally, I do answer that question because I'm trying to weed out who doesn't want me like from the, the get-go because I don't want to waste my time interviewing with them if they ultimately are going to judge me based off of that. Um, I did interview one time it was a job that was in another state and a couple questions in on, it was a phone interview. And I, I don't think I put on that application. Like, I don't know if I could disclose that I had a disability, but I remember I asked her, I was like, I need to cut you off and I need to ask you, is your facility accessible? And she was like, no, it's built. I can't remember what year it was built and it was really old, no elevators, no nothing. So I was like, okay, well, thank you for giving me the chance. But I ended the interview right there because that was a waste of time. So. Um, there is a question on there, but it, it I have not, other than, um, I guess that there is no, I have not had any trouble with the application, I guess. Yeah, I, I mean, that was, that question was on all of my job applications as well. And I really struggled with it, um, you know, because that early, you know, you might get, get weeded out. Um, but 
one of the things is um, the de- one of the government departments uh, targets companies of having 7% of their workforce having a disability. Um, so that therefore makes you uh, kind of a minority group. Um, so that, you know, going back and forth and would that increase my chances, would that decrease my chances? Um, I, I think it's it's up to personal preference, but uh, I think Maggie said it perfectly. If if they were going to weed me out because of my disability, then that's not a place that I was meant to be at. So uh, I personally also just say yes on all of those as well. Okay, so that that actually kind of leads into one of my next questions and kind of topic areas was the interview, right? Let's say you get that application through, you lock down an interview. Um, you mentioned that you both really um, answered that question, you know, all the way through. Um, so the topic of like disability disclosure might not be as um, maybe a tough conversation if it's already on there, they kind of go into the interview knowing that you may have some type of disability, but kind of talk me through disability disclosure. How would you kind of talk about and present your disability um, in a positive light, right? Or, or, or when do you think in the conversation with the interview, if someone didn't check that box or didn't write that sentence, how would you go about that during your interview? Uh, or, or how would you, you know, know or some red flags during that interview process and be like, hey, maybe this isn't a place that I want to necessarily be associated with? Yeah, I think, so one of the things is, is uh, in my cover letter, uh, because I was trying to go into college athletics, I talked pretty heavily about my college athletics experience which included wheelchair basketball. So if you read my cover letter, you were going to have questions about me having a disability. So I think that kind of forced my hand in a lot of interviews about, so we see here you play wheelchair basketball, what's up with that? Um, and having to disclose the disability. But I just think being completely honest about, you know, what the, the limitations might be um, and then kind of counteracting that with, but here are all the incredible reasons that you should hire me. Um, so it was kind of like, well, here's, here's like one of my limitations, but here's something else. So kind of going one-to-one with it um, so that, you know, they would have peace of mind because the last thing you want to do is, you know, get hired at a place that, that isn't acceptable or like accepting of people with disabilities, but also like um, where you're, you're set up for failure, right? Um, uh, because some, some jobs just aren't designed for people with disabilities. And, and, you know, I think the person you're interviewing with you knows that, um, and they're going to be able to have that honest conversation with you, whether that's the right fit for you. So I think disclosing it earlier is better, but I, once again, personal preference, but that's just mine. So I don't, it's funny that Josh brought up <clears throat> about how on his, um, in his cover letter that, you know, he brings up wheelchair basketball um, because on my resume, it talks about wheelchair athletics. And it's really funny walking in an interview sometimes when they're shocked. Like you can see it on their face when I come in that I have a disability. And I'm like, you, you didn't read my resume. Not, cl- not close enough because if you look at it, you can kind of put some pieces together. Um, I don't know if it's like the nature, like besides that one interview that I did have where they brought me into the room to make sure that it was um, that I'd be able to work in it. My disability has not really come up too much, I guess, in interview. Um, just, I guess, because, I mean, I don't know, the, the types of jobs that I've had, like I've either been, you know, sitting at a, at a desk or, um, yeah. And I, I think the job that I have now, because I know somebody, I think, they just didn't have as much reservations, I guess. I, I'm not. I'm not really sure. So I haven't really had experience like that. But um, as far as like really, I guess talking about my my disability in the interview. Um, sometimes I'm trying to. I can't think of any good example um, very clearly. But I I know there's been times where there's been maybe a question where I've related it to my disability and like my way of thinking and being able to connect pe- to people and, and whatnot. Um, I think that's probably the closest that I've come to talking about my disability. Um, but legally to people, I, I think this is correct, could be wrong, but I don't think that they're allowed to ask you about your disability. So just be aware of that if anyone tries to directly ask you. <laughs> I guess which, about it. which once again puts the onus on you to disclose what you think is necessary 
um, which can be hard sometimes. Some people don't want to talk about their disability, but I, I think it's critically important to talk about it at least somewhat um, before you get the job for all the reasons that I talked about before. But yeah, I, I believe you're right. I don't think they're allowed to ask about it in the interview. Yeah. I think the best thing really, the way to kind of, in a roundabout way to kind of bring it up is when um, they ask you, you know, what are your strengths, strengths and weaknesses? Really focus on your strengths and focus on what you can do um, and how you can do it. If there is, again, I can't think of a good example, but if there's something that you have to do differently than an able-bodied person would have to do, explain in detail how you can do that um, so that they know that you can handle it versus, you know, they're just sitting there wondering how they're going to have to help you, how much are they going to have to help you? Um, yeah, just little things like that, I think. Just really talking up your strengths and, and making sure that you kind of bring it up in conver conversation instead of waiting for them to bring things up. Um, and just to, because I, I think when they have to kind of drag things out of you, I think might give them more reservation about your disability. Yeah, that's, that's all really good, really good advice and, and, and experiences. So <clears throat> when it comes to talking about like reasonable accommodations or accommodations that you might need in the workplace, you kind of explained it already that, you know, during that interview conversation, you're going to bring to the forefront, like, hey, this is who I am. This is, you know, this is me, which I really appreciate that. And I'm empower that 100%. Um, but has there been a time, you know, and, and Josh, in your few months of your job here or jobs past or, or Maggie, what has there been a time where you had to kind of advocate for yourself about like, hey, I do need to support in this way, or I do need to modif modify this um, in some way? So my, my biggest accommodation is the fact that, you know, as a person with disability, I have more doctor's appointments um, than your average person. Um, and also moving across the country to a new state, I have to establish new doctors um, relatively quickly. Um, what's great about out here in Salt Lake City is they have a spina bifida clinic for adults. Um, so that was really nice. Didn't know that when I applied for the job, but it's a nice little perk uh, for sure. But my bosses have been fantastic. You know, I was, I was just upfront about that, about how I might need an extra couple of days off here and there for, um, for you know, disability related things. And, and uh, both of my bosses have been fantastic about it, you know not really questioning it and just, you know, making sure that I feel comfortable in my role. And, you know, I, I really appreciate that. Um, so yeah, I, I've had no problem so far uh, with disability stuff. So I think the biggest accommodation at my current job, actually, um, my, so I have the same title as my coworkers, um, but a lot of the facilities that we work at unfortunately, aren't wheelchair accessible. Um, so we do, it's, it's the City of Sandy Springs Parks and Rec Department. There, we do have activities for children with disabilities, um, but they're usually like a, a little day program on the weekends here and there. Um, but our weekly activities are for kids with no disabilities. Um, so it's like soccer and basketball. Um, and the soccer fields at these, at the schools that I work at, I can't get down to them because there's a huge flight of stairs or um, one, my very first day I showed up, I remember a couple years ago and it, it was a pain. Um, and it was down like this huge grass hill. And it, it was just, it was, it was a lot. Um, so my role at this, um, at the field is I'm kind of like the parent contact. So if they have questions, they can want to talk to me. Um, I kind of, you know, I, I do like roll call essentially, even though that's not really, um, like we don't keep attendance or anything like that, but my boss essentially kind of created a role and things for me to, to do while, while I'm at the program, because it's not accessible for me to get down there to actually coach along with the other coaches and help um, run the, the actual program. Um, basketball, on the other hand, that's in the gym. So I can actually participate in that a little bit, you know, obviously more. Um, but I think that's the biggest accommodation that they've, they've done um, is kind of create my role in a way. 
Yeah, I think I, that, that's, that's great. And I really want to applaud that ownership, Maggie, of being like, hey, this is what I need in that um, ability to kind of put some things together to allow you to be a really huge help, but also, you know, make it, make it your own. Um, awesome. Okay, so a couple of questions that I have. Um, so we walked through the application process. We walked through the interview. We walked through that now, hey, I'm, I have sustaining employment. Um, these are kind of my needs and whatnot. Um, but a couple of, couple of questions here. Um, so far in your professional careers, what has been like the biggest professional lesson that you've learned so far? And that could be related to disability or not. Um, but if you were to speak to yourself, you know, back in high school or back exiting, entering college or, or even exiting college, what would you give the biggest piece of advice um, to, to, to past selves? Ask for help. <laughs> um, I think for me, the, the things that I've learned is to really step up and ask for help when you're in the job. But even before that, for me personally, I wish that I, I really wanted to go into um, occupational therapy. And I was told I couldn't because I had a disability and I believed them. And so I didn't pursue it, but I learned that there actually are people with disabilities that are in OT. So my thing is my advice to myself, you know, my younger self and to you guys, when you're looking at going into college, think of what you want to do. And if you, don't know someone in your immediate life that is in that field that has a disability, ask around and find someone who does so that you can see how they do it. Because maybe there is some jobs out there that aren't suitable for people with disabilities, but maybe there, maybe you can make it work for you, but don't let someone who doesn't have a disability tell you that you can't do it because they don't, they're not living with it. So um, I think, I think that's just my kind of biggest regret to a certain extent is not really pushing for what I really wanted to do. Um, but even now in, in my jobs, um, I think there's always been like a little bit of a learning curve and I've never really kn knew, I've not, I've struggled with asking for professional help and how to get better in those positions. And so then I kind of move on to the, the next thing and I kind of start all over again and, and have been trying to, um, I guess, get become more successful in certain fields. And I just haven't really been able to ask the right questions or I'm scared to ask more questions. So that's my two big pieces of, of advice is to, find a career that you, that you want, find someone with a disability that does it, ask them how they do it, and also just continue to ask for help. Yeah, I, I think the asking questions part is huge. You know, what, one of my rituals in all the interviews that I had leading up to this one was asking, you know, what are you looking for in a candidate? And, and the answer always was somebody with a good attitude um, and then somebody who's willing to learn. And that includes asking questions, not being afraid to ask questions. Because at the end of the day, um, especially in these entry level jobs, your boss's success is dependent on your success. Um, so they want to help you and be successful. Um, so that's huge. But I think the, the professional advice I've had so far since I've taken the job is a kind of a two prong thing that's the same thing. Um, it's uh, follow up and pay attention to details. Um, because if you follow up with people, they're going to want to work with you more. Um, and they're going to trust you more and, and whatever your relationship is with them at your job. And then, um, you know, uh, attention to detail, you know, just taking that extra half second, even on a busy day to take a deep breath and make sure that you've dotted all your I's and crossed all your T's, um, is going to be huge and, and making you successful in whatever job that you have. So those would be like the two pieces of advice that I have. Incredible pieces of advice, by the way, from, from both of you. I, I really appreciate you guys sharing that. Um, some other questions for you too. Uh, so you talked about, you know, going into the interviews and applying and everything like that, but to kind of build you up and, and, and 
allow you to kind of go into those situations with some confidence? Were there any resources um, that you guys you know, utilize, whether it be in school or outside school with another organization or anything like that, um, that you could talk about or even let you know the ones listening tonight know about? I'm going to sound like I'm just blowing steam up, up your guys is, uh, but really my, uh, my, my, the biggest, uh, you know, piece of, uh, of confidence was, was what wheelchair basketball gave me. Right. Um, and, and, you know, the camps that I attended as a kid, um, because when you're in those types of environments, you realize you're not the only person with a disability and that makes it less unusual, um, and less weird and, and gives you more confidence in your disability. Um, and so because the biggest moments of my life were in wheelchair basketball, I, had to talk about those things in my interview, which means I had to be comfortable um, talking about my disability. Um, so I would say like just those two pieces of confidence that built up throughout my life. Uh, my, my whole thing is, is the way to make disability less weird from general population is to kill the elephant in the room immediately. So, um, you know, I'll make some sort of comment about it as soon as we walk in just to, to clear the air, like, cause you'll walk into a room and, and it'll be like, people will be like, like, do they know that they have a disability? Well, of course I know I have a disability. Um, <laughs> So uh, just making sure that they know that you know you have a disability, I think really clears the air and makes it easier. So um, I, that's kind of uh, what I've taken away from it. Um, I don't think I really have anything to add necessarily, but yeah, I mean, I guess um, confidence wise, yeah, I think just growing up around other people, I think, I will admit, um, I like my job that I'm in because I get to do sports. Um, but the aspect that's missing for me is the disability part. Um, so I don't know. I think I do still struggle a little bit with confidence in that area. Like I, I am more confident when I'm around a bunch of people that are either not even necessarily people who have disabilities, but I'm pretty comfortable in, I guess, minority settings in general, um, whatever that minority looks like. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm just kind of rambling. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm no, no, that, that was great. I mean, what, 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 what you just expressed is that, um, you know, no matter how you are along your career, there's still stuff, you know, confidence, there's still things that you're developing and, <laughs> Uh, professionally, personally, and, and all that stuff. So I appreciate that vulnerability. Thank you for sharing that. Um, now, was there, let's think about college real quick and kind of exiting there. So they all have a career center, typically. Um, did in your career, did you utilize your career center? Did they help you with any disability specific stuff or like that disability disclosure? Did that something that you just kind of developed on your own talking with your peers with similar disabilities or did they support you in some way? So Illinois has one of the best uh, disability educational resource centers in the country on a college campus. Um, and one of my biggest regrets is I did not utilize it nearly enough um, to the fact like I got a call from Voc Rehab last week uh, asking me if I had employment because I forgot to follow up with them. Once again, follow up, very important. Um, so uh, yeah, I, that's, that's a big regret that I have is, is you know, you most universities have definitely a career center and I utilized them one time. Um, that's not how I got the job, but I did utilize them one time to just figure out where I wanted to go with things. Um, but I didn't utilize the disability specific one. And I really wish I had done that because they have connections and, and you know, Illinois, because of its adapted sports programs has one of the largest um, alumni base of people with disabilities in the country. Um, so I'm sure a lot of people in the career center know who those people are and can hook you up. So I really wish I'd used it, but I didn't. So if you go to a college where that's a thing, definitely utilize it. Josh, I'm a little disappointed. I was really hoping that your answer was yes, because I also did not utilize it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I think mostly from like my experience as far as like, I guess talking about um, interviews and different experiences and stuff has been from just talking with other friends. It hasn't really been from, um, obviously from, from school, from college, from the resources there. But like Josh 
said that Illinois definitely has one of the best ones. So if you decide to go to Illinois, uh, don't be like me and Josh and use it. <laughs> um, also, Josh, you're pretty lucky. I, well, I don't know if, how good your voc rehab counselor was, but the fact that they followed up with you, um, uh, you sound like you had a better one than I did. So it, it was, it was not the one that I left with. It was, it was the new one she followed up. So, well, um, yeah, yeah but I, I, I think the other thing, and this is just a non-disability related employment thing is the best advice I can give is the end of college is a lot sooner than you think it is. Um, and the pandemic uh, also shortened that a lot for me. So I didn't start applying to jobs until like April or May of my senior year, started like January, even earlier, um, because you're going to go through a lot of jobs to find that per perfect fit. Um, and the earlier you start applying, they, they know you're in college and they'll work with you um, in these interlevel jobs. So start applying earlier so you get your job earlier so that you don't have that year gap year that I had. Yeah, um, and, and, and for those um, who are listening, by the way, uh, if you're local to Georgia, um, GVRA uh, is the Georgia, Georgia Vocational Rehabilitation Association. Um, those are the counselors that, or type of counselors that Josh and Maggie are referring to. So if you are searching for one or you don't have one just yet, please reach out to us here at Blaze Sports. We can get you set up. Um, but also, like Josh said, if you haven't heard from someone like that in a while and you are linked up, follow up. Um, especially with the pandemic and whatnot, a lot of people are, you know, short staff, stressed to the max. So just reach out. Um, maybe a little extra nudge can help you get the ball rolling with something. Um, we have about five minutes left, but two quick questions um, I think are both really important. Um, so we talked about college and employment and whatnot, but there's this one piece of employment that we didn't talk about. And it's almost like the pre-employment internships, right? So all these pieces of knowledge, the disability disclosure, the beefing up your resume, really explaining your strengths and weaknesses, just real quick, would all of those things also translate to when you are applying and interviewing for an internship? Can you, I think I missed something. Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Sure, yeah, no, maybe I lag. Um, no. <laughs> we had one, one portion, um, internships. Right. Um, so would you say, just as a, a blanket statement to everyone, um, that all of those pieces of advice, the uh, owning yourself, being upfront with your disability, your strengths or weaknesses, boosting up your resume to make you as marketable as possible, really highlighting those strengths. Is that just right 100 percent transferable to when you're applying and interviewing for internships? I think so. Um, I mean, I got, so the, the, how I ended up with an internship, honestly, at Blaze was, um, I had been applying to jobs for a really long time at that point. I, um, I think I had been out of college for maybe six months and still hadn't had a job. So, and I, my, my resume was not great. Um, cause I hadn't had a job before I had, I mean, I had a, I had a job for a semester in college, but other than that, I had nothing really on there to attract um, people to my resume. So I think Blaze kind of helped me out in that way to um, get something on my resume. And then after a while being there, um, you know, I just really liked it. And so I was able to kind of, I guess kind of ask them for a job. They weren't really hiring at the time um, necessarily. And I just, I was like, I really like being here. And, um, you know, obviously they, thought I, I was good enough to, to hire me and stuff. So I would say it definitely um, it is transferable, but also to uh, maybe look for if there is a specific job that you know that you want or a specific um, company, apply to an internship first at that company. So that way um, they can see, see you in the work field and um, and see how like, basically just get, I guess, get comfortable with your disability for, <laughs> that's the best way I know how to put it um, and see how, how you do work. And um, I think that would be a great way to get your foot in the door. Yeah, I don't really have a good answer for this one because I did have two internships in college, but the first one uh, was with Cello Camps um, and I knew uh, both of the directors. Um, and so that was just an opportunity to give back to, uh, 
chill camps that I went to when I was a kid and see if I wanted to go the nonprofit route. Um, and then the second one that was more beneficial to the job I have now was um, a friend's dad uh, started their own sports communication consulting firm. Um, and it was focusing on name, image, likeness, which is a new thing in college athletics. Um, and he knew I was interested in it. So he reached out to me and, and asked if I'd be interested to intern part-time and I did. And, and that's kind of the experience that got me to the job that I did today was, was that experience. So um, once again, leveraging those connections that you have um, is, is great. And I know this wasn't part of the question, but even if you can't get an internship of where you want to work, find someone in the industry and see if you can shadow them for like a day or a week in the summer, just to see if you like the job. Because one of the uh, worst things you can do um, is, uh, uh, you know, get, get a degree or get a job and then get there and go, I hate this. I, I don't want to do this at all. Um, and so just having that opportunity to shadow and make sure that what you think you want to do is what you want to do, um, I think is, is good advice, especially in your college years. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Thank you so much. And, and one final quick, quick question, but I think that it's really important because it kind of wraps up everything. So just to kind of summarize, we started with talking about the application process, moving into that interview, and then we kind of broke off to that employment interview and those experiences and sustaining employment and those internships. Um, and with those internships, I completely agree. Internships are a great way to get educated on what the field is, and also maybe it could lead to a job. Uh, and I, I tell the athletes, I tell everyone that it's almost, it's more important to know what you don't like to do than know what you like to do, right? Uh, so you kind of go through the weeds. But okay, one final topic that I want to just quickly discuss, because I think it's so important, and I think everyone in the workforce is dealing with it. And I don't think anyone has nailed it down, um, but work-life balance, right? So, hey, you have a job now, great. Well, now you're living, now you're adulting, right? You're, you're, you're living life. Um, how do you maintain that work-life balance um, to maintain that healthy, happy you, and then also that job performance? So just quickly um, touch on maybe how, what you believe is important, you know, hey, the work-life balance, or what do you do to kind of keep yourself level, right? <laughs> so yeah, so I, this will be the last role where I can say this, but I'm really fortunate in that there is a built-in work-life balance in terms of uh, we have to use a software to access our donor database. And I can only access that when I'm in the office. Um, and also the donors don't have my cell phone number. They have my work line. So from the hours of nine to five, I'm all in on the donors. I'm all in on my job. I'm hundred percent on that. But as soon as I leave the office, uh, you know, there's nothing I can really do about it. Even if I get an email, odds are I can't do anything about it till the next morning. So that's been really beneficial of, of that. But then, you know, when you do have that, you know, making sure that you're, you're carving time out for things that, you know, you like to do. So, you know, I'm in, in Utah and, and you know, it's, it's beautiful. So if I had a rough day going for, for a short little hike, you know, on one of the mountains nearby, you know, or um, going for a drive somewhere, just doing something that you like enjoy doing. Um, it's something that just really leaves you centered and, and fills you up so that when, you know, you have those rough days, you're ready to go back hundred percent on, on your job. But uh, right now I'm in a really fortunate position on that work-life balance question. I am also very fortunate in my work-life balance schedule. Um, my job is only part-time. And so I'm just after school. Um, so I work, I work in the evenings. That part, I will admit, I'm not a huge fan of. I work um, instead of, you know, being able to get home at a decent time and, and whatnot. But at the same time, I have my afternoons to kind of do things. Um, and then on the weekends, I just make sure to, um, I, I'm still pretty active. I play wheelchair basketball still. Um, I've gotten really into adaptive uh, mountain biking and uh, climbing with another organization called Catalyst Sports. And so those those things just still being active. And I also do a um, found an online group during the pandemic. Uh, the trainers actually up in um, Fairfax, Virginia. And so I, I try to attend all of those classes as much as I can. They're all online. Um, so for me, it's just still really being active and being outdoors as much as I can. Um, but I'm pretty fortunate with the way my schedule is that I, I get to, to kind of do that. But Tommy, I feel like you should have answered this question. <laughs> the, 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 Blaze, the Blaze staff um, can, can 
you can chime in too as well. Um, but the, my, 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 my purpose of asking this question is just to kind of highlight that how important it is once you're in that employment setting, that your health, physical and mental, is extremely important because um, you're your own moneymaker. Whatever you do, whether whatever job you have, you're self-reliant on yourself. You can control what you do and most of the time how you feel and whatnot. Um, so it's really important to kind of make time for what you like to do. Um, and also, like Josh said, kind of recharge yourself for the next next day. And also, um, just a quick tip is just to, to not get down on yourself if you can't recharge to 100%. Yeah. Right? Um, can I kind of say something? Um, sure. I just triggered my mind on this. So one piece of advice that um, I would like to pass on is if you ever find yourself in a, in a job, a work environment that after, it doesn't even have to be that long, but you just are not fitting in with it. And it's not the, like, you can tell it's not the right place for you. Don't stay. Don't stay too long because I have stayed in a position that was not a good environment and was not good for me. And I will it, it, admit that it's impacted me a lot longer than it should have. Um, and so I guess my, my point is, is just like Tommy said, take care of yourself. Um, I, I was not taking care of myself during that time and I dreaded going to work. So my advice to you is that if you ever find yourself in a spot to where, you know, do what you can to make things better, but if things aren't changing, go somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, I would add to that, like, even if you love your job, there are going to be days that are terrible, no good, very bad days. Um, whether, even if you love your job. Um, and so just, you know, figuring out what your best coping mechanism is for that. Um, and figuring out how you best deal with it, you know, whether it be, you know, in the moment and taking a break or whether it be after work, figure out how you're going to get yourself back in the mindset for, you know, the next day, I, I think is a huge thing um, that, you know, is better to figure out before you get to work, but you're forced to figure that out once you do into the workforce. So those type of coping mechanisms are huge, even if you do love your job. And uh, I would like to reiterate, even though I haven't been through this, that if you, uh, you have like a place that you're not fitting in at, leave. There's, there's so many jobs available uh, and so many, you know, places, especially for those that have college degrees, you know, leave and, and find some place that's going to respect you and, and that you feel is a better fit. So I reiterate that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so, so much for all of the personal experiences, anecdotes, um, knowledge. And it, it's something that I know is true. Um, and it's something that I know here at Blaze that we really appreciate um, and are so thankful that we have people like yourselves that we can kind of lean back on and be like, hey, I want you to talk to all of the youth, even the ones that we have in our program and the ones that are just listening. So um, to all, everyone uh, listening live and on the recording, thank you for attending and a huge thank you to our wonderful alumni, Josh and Maggie. Um, so for any further awesome youth lead content, please follow us on Facebook and Instagram. That's the best way to know all of the happenings with Blaze Sports. Um, we post stories, content. Uh, that's the best way to keep us in the loop. And if you have any questions, you feel free to find my email on our Blaze Sports website. Um, and thank you guys so much again, and have a great night.